Before the digital age of cinema, cinematographers shaped the look of their films by choosing different film stocks. Kodak, Fuji, each one had its own character. You could use the exact same set of lenses, but swap the stock and suddenly the colors, the contrast, and even the texture of the images felt completely different. And while many filmmakers still shoot on film today, the industry as a whole has shifted towards digital. Now the choice that used to be film stock is often the choice of sensor. An Alexa doesn't look like a red, even if you're shooting with the same lenses. A black magic full frame feels different from an Alexa Super 35. The sensor has become our modern film stock, shaping how light is captured, how color is rendered, and how your audience experiences the story. And here's the thing, with a working understanding of digital theory and technology, a cinematographer can confidently choose the best tools for any project. The more we understand how sensors function, the better prepared we are for both technical and creative choices that protect our vision and strengthen our careers. So in this video, I'm going to break down what cinema camera sensors actually do, how their differences shape your images, and why choosing the right sensor is one of the most important creative decisions a cinematographer can make. Let's dive in. At its core, a sensor's job is simple. Take in light, convert it into an electrical signal. Every camera, whether it's an Alexa, a RED, or even your phone relies on this principle. The surface of the sensor is covered in millions of tiny light-sensitive points called photocytes. Each photocyte collects photons, converts them into an electrical charge, and then that charge is read out as brightness values. When you combine all those values together, you get an image. Think of a sensor as a digital canvas. Bigger canvases give you more space to paint, but the texture of the canvas matters too. The size of each photo site, how they're arranged, and how cleanly they pass the signal along all influences the final image. This is why two sensors with the same resolution can look completely different. One might prioritize dynamic range and smooth roll-up in the highlights. Another might squeeze in more pixels for sharpness, but at the cost of low light performance. Film, of course, is analog. It captures a continuous spectrum of color and density in the emulsion. Digital imaging, by contrast, samples light into finite numbers through a process called analog to digital conversion. The more numbers or bits we use, the closer we come to reproducing the analog world. That's why bit depth matters so much in digital cinematography. So while the concept of a sensor is straightforward, the way it's built makes the difference. And that's where we start to see different types of sensors emerge. From CCD to CMOS, from front lit to back illuminated, each design solves the same problem in a slightly different way. And those choices are what give us the variety of looks we see in cinema today. When digital cinema first started gaining traction, most cameras use CCD sensors. They produce beautiful clean images with rich highlight handling, and early digital features like Star Wars Episode II leaned on them. As far as I'm concerned, they should have been shooting digital cinema 20 years ago. People say, why am I doing it? Say, you know, the real question is, why not? The problem, CCDs were expensive, power hungry, and couldn't handle high frame rates very well. They were a bit like film stocks. They look great, but were impractical for fast-paced modern production. That's where the CMOS sensor came in. They were cheaper to manufacture, used far less power, and most importantly, they could read out the image much faster. That speed makes high frame rates, higher resolution, and smaller form factor cinema cameras possible. Today, CMOS dominates the industry from your phone all the way up to IMAX Digital. But even within CMOS, there are differences. Front side illuminated sensors route the wiring over the photosites, which limits how much light each pixel can capture. Backside illuminated sensors, or BSI, move the wiring behind the photosites. That design gives each pixel more surface area for light, which means better low light sensitivity and cleaner shadows. Then there are active sensors. Instead of sending all the data through a shared amplifier, each pixel has its own. That reduces the noise and gives you finer control, especially in complex scenes with a wide range of brightness levels. It's worth noting that in the early days of digital cinema, many cameras actually used three-chip sensors. 
splitting red, green, and blue across separate 2 3rd inch chips. Cameras like the Sony F900 and the Grass Valley Viper use this design. Today, cinema almost exclusively uses single chip sensors with Bayer patterns. That shift opened the door to large formats, reduced depth of field, and full use of the 35mm lens ecosystem. Sensor size is probably the most talked about spec in cinematography. Super 35 has been the standard for decades, echoing the size of Super 35mm film. It gives you a familiar depth of field, a huge lens ecosystem, and a balanced look. Move up to full frame and your field of view opens up. Depth of field gets shallower, bokeh gets creamier, and your wide shots feel bigger and more immersive. Push it further, like Ari's 65mm or IMAX digital sensors, and you're in a whole other world, where images feel almost three-dimensional. But bigger doesn't always mean better. Larger sensors demand lenses that can cover them, and sometimes the shallower depth of field makes pulling focus a nightmare. Super 35 remains popular because it strikes a perfect middle ground. And of course, the sensor size is only half the story. The other half is how the sensor creates a color image. The latest generation of digital cinema cameras almost exclusively use Bayer pattern single chip sensors. This design allows the use of traditional 35mm lenses without the drawbacks of prism splitting systems, like added weight and chromatic aberration, while giving us the depth of field we intuitively associate with film. In simple terms, the sensor itself doesn't actually see color. A silicon layer converts photons into electrical charge. A Bayer filter array, a mosaic of red, green, and blue filters sits on top of those photosites. Each pixel site only measures one color, so the camera uses algorithms to interpolate the missing data. That process we call the Bayerine. Here's the catch. Only about half of the pixels record green, and a quarter each red and blue. That means a 1920 by 1080 Bayer sensor won't resolve a true 1920 by 1080 image. The effective resolution is lower. How close it gets depends on the filter design and the de Bayer algorithm itself. Ari's algorithm emphasizes smooth tonal transitions and skin tones. Red gives you control of the de Bayer in post, letting you decide how aggressive or subtle it should be. Black Magic leans on his B-Roll codec to keep things lightweight while still flexible. And this ties directly into the debate between video versus data, raw versus the Bayard formats. Some cameras record compressed video formats, like ProRes or MPEG, where the de Bayer happens in real time. Others like Red and Ari offer raw, storing all that sensor data before it's processed. Wall keeps a maximum dynamic range in color fidelity at the cost of larger files and heavier workflows. This is why two cameras can both claim to shoot 4K, but the resulting image may look very different. One may resolve more actual detail, while the other prioritizes natural color reproduction. The sensor design and the debayer process are inseparable, and together they define the camera's visual character. There's one more critical factor to understand about sensors, the shutter mechanism. Most digital cinema cameras use a rolling shutter. That means the sensor scans line by line from top to bottom, recording the image progressively. When the accumulation cycle is complete, each row of pixels is exposed and read out sequentially, not simultaneously. Because of this, different parts of the image correspond to slightly different points in time. That sequential readout is what introduces artifacts. Fast pans can cause vertical lines to lean, Flashes of light can show up as partial exposures, and moving objects, like a spinning propeller, can look bent. This is sometimes called the jello effect. There are also more pronounced with very small, inexpensive sensors, like those in smartphones and small HD cameras. A global shutter, on the other hand, exposes the entire sensor all at once. That eliminates motion skew and flash banding, giving you cleaner motion rendering. But there's a trade-off. Global shutters are more complex and expensive to design, and they often sacrifice a little bit of dynamic range or low-light performance because of the architecture required to hold all that charge at once. For example, Red's Komodo uses a global shutter to eliminate skew, while Ari sticks with rolling shutters on most cameras to maximize dynamic range. Neither is inherently better. It comes down to what matters most for the project. High-action VFX or drone shots might benefit from global shutter. 
narrative work often favors the look and latitude of rolling shutter. When we start comparing actual cinema camera sensors, it comes down to how the sensor is designed and what its priorities are. Take the Ari Alexa 35. It's Super 35, but its newly engineered ALA 4 CMOS sensor delivers up to 17 stops of dynamic range. Ari isn't chasing megapixels. They're optimizing pixel pitch to give smoother highlight roll-offs and better color response. Compare that to the RED V-Raptor XL. Its 8K Vista Vision sensor pushes over 35 megapixels on a full-frame chip, delivering massive resolution for detail and reframing in post. Like most of RED's design philosophy, the V-Raptor XL leans heavily on its raw workflow, giving filmmakers granular control over debayering and image reconstruction. The Ari Alexa LF and Mini LF go large format, but with fewer pixels than RED. Ari's philosophy is all about color science and dynamic range. Their carefully tuned DeBayer pipeline is why Alexa footage has such natural skin tones. Then there's cameras like the Blackmagic Cinema Camera 6K, a full-frame sensor that prioritizes accessibility and workflow. Its DeBayering is less proprietary, but it pairs with DaVinci Resolve's color science to give filmmakers flexibility without breaking the bank. So really what we're looking at are sensor philosophies. Do we value resolution, dynamic range, or color fidelity? Each design leans in a different direction, and that's why they look and feel so distinct. In the past, cinematographers reached for film stock. Kodak for warm tones, Fuji for cooler contrast. Today, for most productions, our film stock is the sensor. An Alexa, a RED, a Blackmagic, each one brings its own personality, just like choosing between stocks in the days of film. So when you're picking a camera, you're not just picking a resolution or frame rate, you're picking your stock. You're deciding the palette your story will be painted on. At the end of the day, sensors are more than rectangles of silicon. There are hidden storytellers shaping light, depth, and color. The best sensor is the one that tells your story the way you want it told. And here's the bigger picture. The working understanding of digital theory and technology, a cinematographer can confidently choose about methods and devices for any project. As new challenges arise and new tools emerge, it's our responsibility to stay informed to make both the technical and creative choices that preserve our intent and ultimately shape our careers. If you found this video helpful, hit like, subscribe, and drop a comment about what sensor or even film stock you're most curious about. Let's keep pushing each other to learn, create, and grow as storytellers. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.